Okay, so we are live. Um, we'll wait a little bit for people to join. We have zero viewers until now. I'm texting Mirna and uh, the GA to see if they can see us. Yeah. Anyways, we're going to save like the presentation so later on people uh, would be able to uh, listen and uh, yeah, 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 that would be on YouTube, correct? Yeah, yeah, on YouTube. Great, great, wonderful. That's better because of time difference. I'm sure a lot of people yeah, will I can imagine. I can imagine. That is, <laughs> that is the wonderful thing of uh, webinars, but at the same time, the main problem because of the time frame. Yeah, exactly. Fortunately, there is the save uh, like option. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so people are joining. I think uh, we can start. Yeah. Uh, hello, and thank you to each and every one of you for tuning in today. I really hope you and your loved ones are safe from this pandemic. I would like to welcome you to our first IADS virtual congress. We are very pleased to be able to welcome those of you that have been with us for a long time now, and as well as those who are new to the page. We have prepared two days of knowledge packed webinars with renowned dental professionals from diverse backgrounds. To note also that active participants will be rewarded with a certificate of participation at the end. It's my honor today to introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Flavio Pisani. Dr. Flavio Pisani graduated from Den dentistry from the Catholic University of Rome, Italy in 1993. He holds a master's in clinical dentistry and oral surgery, a master's in implant dentistry and a master's in periodontology. Periodontology. He completed his PhD in dentistry in, uh, in 2008 at the University of Rome. Before relocating to the UK, Professor Flavio has been actively involved as a clinical teach teaching fellow in dental education focused on periodontology and oral and implant surgery. And at undergraduate and, and as well as postgraduate courses in several Italian universities. Professor Flavio is a member of the Italian Society of Periodontology and Implantology. Uh, he has also a special interest in the management of periodontal diseases and advanced treatments of regeneration and root tablet surgery. Currently, Dr. Flavio is holding the position of full professor in periodontology at College of Medicine and Dentistry, Birmingham, UK, and he is passionately leading a master's program in periodontics. Today, Dr. Flavio will be talking about rational and periodontal regeneration, and to be a little more specific, he will be tackling how growth factor can help the biological response. Dr. Flavio, I don't want to make too, I don't want to take too much time of your time. I need to leave some time uh, for you to introduce yourself uh, and fill, uh, fill in uh, with all the interesting topics. Uh, so, Dr. Flavio, we are so happy that you're joining us today. The floor is now yours, and we are all ears. Thank you very much, Hania. Uh, first of all, I would like to really to thank all the organization. For me, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to speak in your venue. Um, actually, I would like to thank Hania and Merna, especially Merna, that I met a few years ago. Um, she basically came to see uh, to join a summer school uh, our place and since then we established a good friendship and a good collaboration and uh, honestly this occasion brings me back in the years and it's very very 
nice for me to come back because you cannot imagine uh, at my time I was part of the uh, of your organization as a student first and then as a graduate I tried my best to struggle and to bring our position and our figure uh, around the world in a more I would say good position and good heritage today I would like to basically to give you a glance of uh, what are basically uh, the new advance um, in periodontal regeneration, especially in the light of a, of a topic that is very debated at the moment. Well, in which growth factors basically have been introduced, but unfortunately the evidence about them is not still very, uh, very clear. First of all, I would like to bring you to discuss about periodontal regeneration because that is an amazing, an amazing option that we have, especially because the periodontal ligament is, seems to be a, a so, such a kind of a very weak and, uh, and a precious tissue. And uh, normally, normally everyone basically is aiming to have um, this kind of uh, process to be obtained. It looks like the, something that is, seems so unreliable sometimes. Um, according to the definition that we have, the periodontal regeneration is not a repair, but is a de novo formation of a periodontal attachment, including cementum, a, a functionally oriented periodontal ligament, and the alveolar bone. So when we talk about periodontal regeneration, we are not actually thinking only about bone. That is normally what uh, people are always looking at. We are basically, as, a peri as periodontists, we want to re-establish the biology as it was before the periodontal disease basically created the damage. When we have a periodontal disease, mostly we have uh, defects. These defects are basically different dif kind of defects. We might have some infrabony defects, we can have superbony defects and we can have vacation defects. So basically all these defects are basically the loss of uh, attachment, the loss of the periodontal ligament and the loss of the alveolar bone around teeth. And this makes basically the prognosis, the long-term surviving of these teeth very weak. So potentially our aim is to bring all these tissues back or eventually if this is not possible, to make this kind of situation viable with the, the maintenance for, from the patient and basically to, to avoid or to stop the progression of the periodontal disease damage. So in a way, in a way, periodontal regeneration is not something that happens for just for, for chance. Uh, throughout the years, many, many studies have been done and they started basically investigating what was the actual behavior of cells around this area. I'm talking about different kinds of cells, of course. I'm talking about uh, bone cells, I'm talking about periodontal cells, um, connective tissue cells, and especially epithelial cells. It was not an achievement that was gained in a few minutes. Um, we will see that the first instance basically goes back to 1976. But what basically at the end, okay, came as a, as a sort of uh, uh, rule, okay, in terms of um, obtaining a periodontal regeneration, basically uh, stick, sticks with three main concepts. The wound stability, the space provision, and the absence of bacterial contamination. Wound stability because we want basically to have, in a way, this tissue to be stable and we will see what is the stability we want to achieve. The space for me, putting some graphs or something that will basically obtain the triggering of regeneration. And of course, our uh, aim is always to fight against bacteria. So we don't want that this embryonal condition could be damaged from the side effects of bacteria. 
The first idea about regeneration was basically created by Anthony Melcher, who was a very, very impressive researcher because without having any proof of evidence, he actually understood that there were many different cells involved in this kind of issue. His observation started with some uh, observation on fracture repair on young and old people, and he flagged that four tissues might be in, 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 involved, the gingiva, the connective tissue, the periodontal ligament, and the alveolar bone. And actually, he understood that if there was any chance to design some surgical procedures that would allow the colonization of wounds, okay, coronal to the alveolar crest, by a sort of modulation of the effects of tissues or basically making some cells to be stopped or making some cells to speed up their healing and their growth, that could be potentially provide a fruitful field for investigation. So in a way, I know you might know this kind of cars. Now they are, mostly they are Italian. <laughs> I, I can say that with a, a very good pride um, of my nation. And that one on your left side of your screen is a Ferrari. The other one that looks so small and tiny is a Cinquecento, the old one. If we can actually bring this concept to be pictured as a race or a car race in which we have very, very fast cells like epithelial cells and we have very slow, slow cells but still able to grow like the periodontal ligament cells that we might resemble like a very old Cinquecento. They are all nice, they can all provide effects but we need in a way to make a sort of difference in the race, putting the Cinquecento to start first and maybe or eventually to stop Ferrari to drive very fast. Let's analyze one by one this concept because this is not uh, a lecture, of course, a uh, school lecture, but it, it makes you understanding why our aim, aim today and why our concerns today about um, blood growth factors could be create uh, could be uh, potentially interesting in this field. So Vika Shaw, uh, a Swedish researcher who moved to the United States in 1991, he made a nice and interesting observation regarding the um, role of the blood clot at, for regeneration. Basically, he understood that the blood clot stability around the roots in regeneration might be the triggering effect for regeneration to happen. So it looks like that the regeneration is not something that happens uh, in a void space without with these cells basically to come over. It is a sort of effect due to the a blood clot formation that it needs to remain stable. In fact, what he did, he basically varnished okay, the, root, uh, the root of this experimental periodontitis on dogs with uh, heparin. And he found out that as soon as heparin was actually preventing um, the plasma proteins to be absorbed and adhere, adhering on the root surface and the blood clot formation to happen, this kind of regeneration wouldn't happen at all. So he understood the main role of the blood clot in this process. Regarding space provision, yes, we need to leave this space for something, either if it is the blood clot first and then later something else, maybe a granulation tissue. So I report this paper that I think in your studies you might remember is from Neiman et al. in 1982, in which they found in a, an experimental study in men, basically that if we have a potential regeneration that will follow only the area where the space between a sort of guide that might be a membrane, in this case it was used a millipore membrane that is a filter tissue that normally they use in lab, just basically to stop the gingival interface to come over in the space of regeneration. And if there is no collapse, 
and if there, even if there is a connective occlusion, basically this kind of process can happen. But the funny thing is that can happen as soon as the scaffold can basically work out, in this case, where the bone crest was giving chance to be supportive. So basically, if you have uh, no sides, basically, or no space, basically, for this process to happen, no regeneration will happen. So basically, if you look in the screen at the histology, I don't know how much you are, uh, you know, uh, trained in histology um, checking on slides. Basically, if you have a, 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 a look on the right, on the left side of the screen, you can see the tissue regenerating. On the right side of the screen, this tissue is not regenerated because actually the membrane actually is completely collapsed on the root surface. So space is needed. Space is needed for the blood clot to stay. Space is needed for the cells and the process to happen. If the um, membrane stops this process to happen, nothing will come. At the same time, we know very well how bacteria are nasty in periodontology and how in periodontal disease and how bacteria are able to trigger a fibrinolytic effect, basically, so to disrupting the blood clot and how, especially in the past, we were using uh, no resolvable membrane, how fast could be the colonization and the spreading of bacteria over uh, non resolvable membrane and even in case of resolvable membrane how fast is the resorption of the membrane without any effect before that the right time frame for regeneration to happen and basically this is related to their particular behaviors enzymes and all their toxic effects at the same time on the leukocytic activity of our immune response so, having well in mind these three concepts, let's see how the healing time frame in, uh, in uh, regeneration, but in normal oral wounds, happen. Um, I bring, brought you here this nice uh, graph that Polymeni provided in 2006, and I would like to flag to you this kind of speed behavior of response. Normally, if we look at the skin wounds or whatever other skin uh, wound in the body, normally the time frame is not that. In, in the oral tissues, we have a particular condition in which our oral fibroblasts are able to do many, many tasks and many jobs. They are very um, versatile cells. They can do uh, their job as fibroblasts. They can work as uh, macrophages and they can actually work even as myofibroblasts so there is a sort of uh, potentiality of these cells to express in different tasks according to the healing time frame in the, the proper inflammation that we remember very well from pathology that might stand for long in the oral tissues will go basically at the main peak even in hours it will not even stand for days. I mean, in three day, less than three days, that will be over. At the same time, an overlap of uh, the granulation tissue formation will take place from basically, uh, I would say, eight hours later, and it will stand until 10 days. And all the other part of the wound healing will be actually the contraction that it relates to the effect on the traction of myofibroblasts, in this case the fibroblasts that took this job, to basically to make whatever healing it is to become a sort of primary healing in order basically to achieve the closure of the flat margin. Whatever happens later from, I would say, 15 days over in the long term, is just the matrix formation and remodeling, but the wound itself is done. So in a way, you can imagine how funny is to say that regeneration or whatever happens starts very early and whatever happens later. So I think that many of you knew that uh, we are reassessing regenerated tissue, reprobing around teeth after regeneration about six months after.
that's fine. But it's not because the wound is still healing. It's just because the matrix formation and remodeling are actually taking place. And this is the importance why, in terms of surgical advices, we need to overlook the patient, especially in the first 20 days. If we look a, a little bit closer of what is the process, we can see that in 10 minutes, all the adhesion of the red blood cells and the blood clot is starting. So in a way, we have already something in place. In one hour, already a fibrin network is, play, is there. In, in about six hours, we have the early inflammation starting and, as I said, a six, eight hours, and we can have the fibrin network in place as well with all the dense framework to start. In, uh, in, in uh, three days after, you can see on the right side, back load of your screen, a late inflammation with macrophages is already there. But if we look at the situation about four and seven days, the granulation tissue already looks like set in a mature fibrin clot with a cell-rich connective tissue adapted around roots in seven days. So you can imagine how early is the process to happen, how important is the close um, observation of the wound healing, especially in the first few hours. This is Rome, of course. I know many of you know my city and I am still in love with that, even if I work uh, abroad. Um, we have, clinically speaking, those are basically the concepts, the biological concepts around regeneration. Putting that in the clinical aspects, we have three main uh, aspects that we, or factors that we need to have a look at when we are dealing with regeneration. First of all, the local site characteristics. What does it mean, local site characteristics? Is regeneration still potentially useful for all the defects we have? Absolutely not, because we need to have some particular uh, characteristics in place. And this is because uh, we know very well that cells are not able to build up everything on on their own and especially that should be some particular features in place i mean every one of you have seen um, building uh, refurbishment or building works in the cities and sometimes when they are doing just even the painting the buildings they need to have a scaffold outside of the building same happens here we need to have some particular uh, conditions for regeneration to happen. So not all the defects we spoke about at the beginning are suitable for regeneration. In this case, we might understand that mm, we differentiate, especially in bony defects, around the number of walls that are still remaining rather than has been they have been lost. So in a way, a potential defect, infrabony defects with three walls is actually the best condition to obtain regeneration because if you imagine a box right and you have um, three walls of this box you just need another one that will be able to contain much more of a box in which only one side is left because the blood clot is a sort of gel at the beginning so it needs to be stable in this box if you have more walls the box will be containing the blood clot, this gel. Otherwise, the gel will spread away. At the same time, you need to remember that there are some other features. I'm not talking about those today, but just to make you aware that this box needs to be very containative. So if this box is narrow, is deep, this box will play much better than an open and white box without walls. So the con concept around here, around this, is to have many walls, if possible, very deep, that will work as a cone to contain the blood clot, and potentially not very wide. Then we have all these factors that are actually working around regeneration in terms of effects that we can have. 
as you can see here, we have mainly the subject in which we can have smoking attitude, plaque as a risk factors basically to trigger even the bacteria to be even nastier that will play on the subject. So whatever is a, a risk actually factor working at the subject level needs to be stopped or reduced. But then, as, we, as I said before, the defect itself represents the second point of interest in which you can have the defect morphology to work. As we said, the number of walls, the length and the depth of the defects, the angle, but at the same time, uh, even all the conditions that are around that, for instance, the endodontic condition of the tooth, which tooth we are talking about, either we are talking about a single rooted teeth, tooth or we are talking about a molar, if the tooth is moving, so in a way, the absorption of the blood clot to the root surface will be impaired. All these conditions, and I'm, I know you are very fond of endo because I've seen you are running uh, seminars about endopelio, you can imagine how important is basically to have an overlook of these concepts and these aspects before going for your regeneration. But then there is another thing that needs to be encountered, that is the surgical procedure. That is not an easy one. Eh? If you compare all the regenerative procedures and surgical techniques for regeneration, they are not very uh, I would say bread and butter. You need to have a very good high-end skills and, uh, and, and, and you need to know which kind of surgical approach is better than others. As I said, the scaffold retention is important because the scaffold retention to stabilize the blood clot is because the cells are coming from the other places. So if the scaffold is actually useful, you will get regeneration, otherwise you will not. The importance of blood clot stability in regeneration is because the blood clot is actually a source of cells and it gives the adhesion to start regeneration to even because the roots themselves, they are not vascularized. So you deal even with a vascular surfaces and this is the most difficult thing because you need to have a sort of uh, I would say um, storage okay, in the blood clot for allowing the process to go on without any further, especially in the first few hours, any further um, in, input from other vessels. If there is a, a, a in, 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 on top of this, the problem is that with, within every surgical procedure, you might have a sort of vascularization impairment. And this is how to prove this. Uh, MacLean in 1995 made a, a wonderful study. So basically he actually uh, checked uh, with a fluorescence uh, study the, um, the reflow after surgery from the vascular uh, component of the area. So he compared the interproximal sites with the mid buccal sites. And you can imagine that basically the reflow in the interproximal sites was actually impaired uh, up to 10 days, okay? So in a way, um, at, until seven days it was really impaired, it was growing up to come back to the same vascularization support at 10 days. What does it mean, this one? The problem is that when you are doing your surgical procedure to get regeneration, you need actually to rely on the blood clot because vascularity will not support until 10 days. And as soon as we said that basically all the regeneration process happens in the first days, you can imagine how important it will be to overlook the blood clot stability, to overlook what conditions over there are able to contain the blood clot, not to make that basically to disrupt, and how important is the surgical technique you will provide not to delay further than 10 days this kind of vascular impairment. There is another factor, that is the innate healing potential. The innate healing potential relies basically on the host cells. So immunity that comes from the reaction or the uh, chemotaxis of PMNs, and then all the reorganization of macrophages to clean the wound, 
and basically to trigger not anymore the innate wound healing potential, but the adaptive immunity, and then to allow all the cells, for instance, if you can see here, uh, I hope you will be able to see my, my pointer, there, is, there are all the periodontal ligament cells that are growing from the more apical part of the, of the periodontal ligament to come back in the most coronal part of the wound. And remember that in regeneration, the, the other problem we have is that the actual root surface that is contaminated is where we have the acellular cementum. That if you remember from your embryology uh, concepts and knowledge, is not something that comes back very easily. So even our process to bring this patient to receive regeneration is to save as much as we can this tissue, even because then the modern concept towards the scale root planing, this root surface have been abandoned. So we need to do only a disruption of the biofilm. So in a way, if we think that we have this kind of cell activity over there, in a way, Together with the concept that we said before regarding to selectively stop or speed up some cells like the Ferrari and the Cinquecento in the wound healing regeneration process, we might use something to boost other cells. Okay, so in another way, we can basically help the regeneration, boosting the, some cells basically to work much better. In this case, some biological mediators have been found. One is very common, and you might know about it, is endogen. Uh, they are called amelogenins. These amelogenins are basically proteins produced by the, um, the uh, enamel organ, basically to, to develop, in a way, the cementum and the periodontal ligament. There is a very um, com complex process in which the dentin and the enamel at the same point they are basically stopping the enamel to, to work and to for the cemental cells basically to grow on the root surface together with the mantle dentin it's 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 a, a biological concept i don't want to uh, bore you with this concept but just to understand where basically the endogen starts from and but why not, together with these growth factors? In a way, uh, the role of a biological mediator, as Kulen said in uh, 2000, is basically to do many, many tasks. One is to favor the fibrin absorption, fine. We said that this is something that we want. To stabilize the blood clot, wonderful. To favor the angiogenesis, because something that actually we need, because we need a, a angiogenesis to start again to, to basically to trigger regeneration. Trigger the macrophages, fine, because we need them into the wound healing process as a, an innate and later immunity response. Potentially and hopefully to work as an antimicrobial agent because, of course, bacteria in a way will be there anyway and then to stimulate the stem cells recruitment and differentiation. We have stem cells in that area, so we want them. And to stimulate the metabolism and the proliferation of connective tissue cells with the production of collagen and maybe switching the collagen in a major phase of the wound healing, fine. Um, then we have the sur surgical techniques. Actually, we said before, one of the main concern is about revascularization of the um, interproximal um, tissues, in this case, the papilla. You know very well how papilla is important. The papilla is actually something that represents a sort of network between different vascularities in periodontology, in the periodontal tissues. I mean, we have the supraperiosteal tissues, we have the, um, the, the vascular plex, um, plexiform uh, vessels from the periodontal ligament. Uh, so all together, they will. These three compartments will join into the papillary uh, structure. While on the other areas, this is not happening. So, in a way, the sur every surgical technique that deals with regeneration is needs to tick some boxes. One is basically 
as we said before, to create the condition for the wound stability and to allow a sort of primary intention closure. We don't want open wound healings. I mean, we are concerned when this happens. We want always to see a nice healing in which flaps basically are able to join together without any tension in a sort of a primary pattern. We need to allow at the same time space provision. So if the blanket is very short, we make the blanket longer in a way to cover our graft or whatsoever. We need to absolutely avoid any bacterial superinfection, but at the same time, we need to respect the integrity of the vascular supply. Even because in a way, later on, even if you use a membrane or not, Four weeks later, this connection needs to be re-established from the inner side of the wound with the outer side of the wound. So, in this paper from Vergara and Cafés, basically in 1997, demonstrated that we need to have this vascular network to reopen. And, and as we said before, we cannot leave more than 10 days these tissues without any vascularity support. So, the interdental papilla needs to be respected. This is the reason why all, mostly all the um, surgical approaches in regeneration are actually trying to save the papilla. In fact, we know them, uh, I mean, as usual, as papilla preservation techniques. They have been developed uh, over time. Basically, um, uh, you can see this, this case, we will see that later in more details. A good respect of the papilla, sometimes even avoiding, in a way, to elevate this papilla, keeping that in place to have all the vascularity support, can bring this wound after just one week, okay, to be able to look mature and very well healed. This is what actually we want. So this is uh, in, uh, the case you can see after the uh, the treatment, and as you can see from the from the screen, it was not even a, a very favorable defect because we we had a three walls defect in the deepest part of our defect, but in the um, most coronal part, it was looking like having less walls than. But then with a proper approach, in this case, a single flap approach was used. As you might know, this was developed by Tom Trombelli and it basically avoids to elevate the papilla to, to, uh, totally from the palatal side, basically making only a buccal flap and then trying basically to create the condition of uh, um, uh, a coronary advancement basically to meet uh, a primary wound healing later. This kind of case with a defect that was almost 12 millimeters, either palatal and buccal, and was looking like as an hemiseptor in a way, was able to be regenerated, having a slight recession, not that much if you see, actually to get a complete healing. And this is the radiographic expression of what we got. This case was treated with grow factors actually and bios it was not treated with endogen so having said that grow factors how grow factors can help in a good and performing periodontal regeneration actually the autogenous blood concentrate grow factors on the market are many i tried basically to classify them in three main uh, groups. One is the PRP, that is plasma-rich protein. Another one is the big family of PRF, in which uh, that is plasma-rich fibrin. And then there is another one that is actually an evolution of PRF. Sometimes it's debating if it is still a PRF or not. That is the CGF or concentrated growth factor. Let's see how we can get benefit of these materials that are basically of autogenous, so the same patient blood that is actually processed to have basically these bi this, uh, biomodulators or I would say booster of regeneration to happen instead of using endogen. I mean, sometimes endogen is not the proper choice. You know, in many countries, as soon as they are 
uh, pores in the right cannot be used. So potentially these blood growth factors, as soon as they are autogenous, organic, let's say, no animal derived, could be a viable option for the future. Even because they, you will see, they match and they tick all the boxes we discussed about, either as a regenerative material, as a booster. So what actually the autogenous plasma derived growth factors will contain? They contain mostly a lot of things. Let's see from this nice paper from Ganati, 2014. Basically, there is TGF beta 1 that we know that helps and support even the wound contraction. We have PDGF that is splatter at the right growth factor, the vascular growth factor, the epidermal growth, epidermal growth factor, epithelial growth factor, insulin growth factor. And then we have a lot of cells actually there. We have platelets, we have PMNs, so a lot of white cell PMNs, macrophages, T lymphocyte, B lymphocyte, and stem cells. So it looks like very, I mean, comprehensive in a way. But then what or which one should I choose? Because the problem is now this one. They think that they can be used for every kind of option, uh, especially they have been used in bone regeneration. So not in GTR, that is what we are talking about, but in terms of GBR. So in uh, regeneration of bone before implant surgery. As a periodontist, my main concern, first of all, is to see if we can use them for periodontal regeneration because I mean before taking teeth out maybe there is an option to keep them before doing implants and to increase the time span of uh, <laughs> tooth replacement for the future so from this paper I mean, I mean it's difficult to find a comprehensive comparison between all of them but then I tried basically to make you aware what is the difference at least between one and the other one so comparing from Kobayashi in 2017, PRP versus PRF, we can see that potentially PRF is more viable to support the wound healing in regeneration closely more longer than PRP, because PRP seems to work in the first minutes or the first few hours of the, of the wound healing process. As you can see, either in the release of PDGF, TGF and BEGF, PRP seems to be viably very active in the first hour, maximum eight hours, then it disappears, while uh, PRF is more active either than L or the A PRF, and very active throughout until 10 days afterwards. And in terms of cell migration, you can see how different, how much different is basically the number of cells migrating with PRF compared to, of course, the control, that is the sham surgery and the PRP. And even in terms of uh, mRNA that you can encounter after seven days later. If we compare now PRF with versus CGF, you cannot find big differences, but in a way, um, CGF might be more supportive in the latest part of the wound healing. That is not bad in terms of uh, especially TGF and BGF because it's a sort of uh, keeping boosting the uh, vascular proliferation and keeping boosting the, the fibroblast differentiation in myofibroblast. So, Potentially, CGF could be a viable option in periodontal regeneration. We might say that compared to PRP, that is the first one that has been introduced, and according to the fact that PRP contains a lot of excipients in the preparation of the, of the, of the growth factor, CGF is more organic and we can do a lot of things with that. First of all, because it increases our blood clot stability. That is something that we were looking for. But it actually increases a lot the fibrin texture. So it means that it will become a sort of a, a viable, trust me, membrane that will catch everything in. We will see that has even antimicrobial effects in the early healing, and it can actually enhance the vascular response. But it's not finished. 
we can have an enhancement of cementogenesis that is actually part of the wound healing process in regeneration, enhancement of the connective tissue, and what we were looking for, PDL recruitment and enhancement. So in a way, it works exactly as MDOGEN does. So have a look on, of the increased blood clot stability and fibrin texture. Have a look at the second picture in which CGF is compared to a control and APRF. The texture seems to be increased. There is a cell retention and entrapment in this kind of texture. That is what we want, actually. And then this kind of texture is in, able to increase the blood clot stability, retention, the stability of the, of the blood clot, and the firm adhesion to the roots. So it works very well in this case. From This is a paper from Lay in 2019. And this is one of the studies we run in our college in which we even found out that the CGF is able to work as an antimicrobial. Of course, it doesn't work for the long term, of course, because that is related to the big uh, number of white cells that it contains. But then what is actually overlooked is that it works very well, especially as a perioperative antimicrobial, in a way that is frankly effective in the first hour during the tre after the treatment and then supporting the antimicrobial effects up to four hours, especially against what? Against the, anti uh, the classic uh, periodontal pathogens like Prevotella. In terms of uh, vascular enhancement, it's absolutely outstanding due to the BEGF values that you can still keep uh, across 10 days after. And it is actually dose related. So in a way, putting a lot of concentration of, of CGF, we will have more endothelial cell proliferation migration and then vascularity um, enhancement. You can see here in this paper from June, uh, June in 2018, how even with 10% concentration of CGF, you might have more cell migration and more vascular proliferation. In terms of uh, stem cells involvement, again, CGF is very effective. This paper from Zhang in 2019 kept an eye to the uh, observation of the periosteal cell uh, proliferation, and it was able to check that this kind of enhancement and boosting for bone, I would say, this basically was absolutely stable and increasing up to 20 days after basically the, the use of it. And basically, this is important not only for periodontal regeneration, as you might know, but even for, um, uh, for bone regeneration. So it works very well even in GBR because it actually triggers bone response very effectively to even basically addressing in some particular cases PDL stem cells in case they are not needed to become osteoblasts. And then what we are, were looking for, PDL cells enhancement. So Kiao et al. in 2016, he was able to find that even if we don't put a lot of concentration of CGF, we are actually obtaining a very increased migration, proliferation first, and migration of PDL cells. So you can imagine at that point when we are doing our periodontal treatment, our surgical for uh, regeneration, this blood clot over there containing CGF, used for, can actually stimulate all the periodontal ligament cells basically to be proliferating and migrating in a faster way, like in this case a Ferrari, to basically uh, deal with the blood clot and to start the regeneration and the de novo formation of periodontal ligament. Unfortunately, guys, the problem with this kind of growth factors and these papers have been produced for growth factors is not very evidence-based. So all these uh, papers are actually able to be seen where actually... <coughs> sorry. To be seen 
in, um, in open gray literature, in uh, Boolean uh, uh, operators in which we don't have uh, journals or papers aiming at randomized control clinical trials, there were some attempts to do a sort of, I would say, Cochrane revisions for or reviews or systematic reviews to see which one was more effective or not. But the, all the studies, unfortunately, do not match the quality criteria to be an, involved or to be actually included in these reviews. There is a sort of evidence from this paper from Del Fabro et al. in 2018, in which there is no advantage actually to use growth factors with other uh, elements like uh, endogain. So either if you use endogain or growth factors instead of both, um, but there might be some advantages to use them together with some bone graft, especially in open flap debridement. We don't want this. We want more detailed information, don't we? Um, anyway, just to give you a sort of an idea, um, Zhu et al. in 2018 tried to look at the use of CGF in periodontal regeneration. He was able basically to prove what we already said in a systematic review and a meta-analysis. It, it can work as a graft is able to basically act as a membrane and that is due to what we said before, this super extra fibrin mesh that uh, CGF has compared to PRP and PRF. The performance is actually related to the growth factors and that is impressive because you might remember that from Cortellini and Tonetti, we understood that the surgical techniques actually is the most important factor, whatever is the bone graft or the material we are using. So it's very impressive. And there is a sort of an antimicrobial action that it can work out, as we found in one hour after and four hour after. Uh, and there is a higher production of PDGF, VGF and TGF beta-1. Uh, in Myron 2017, basically overlooking PRF, even PRF is able actually to work very well for periodontal regeneration. Uh, of course, it works much better than sham surgery, fine, better results if combined with bone graft, in this case, or collagen membrane, no difference with endogen. So, in a way, what is, Myron wants to say is that we don't need another booster, either if we use endogain or we use, um, we need to use one of those, not or endogain or um, CGF or PRF or growth factors. There is no need of use both, but then the use of bone graft or membrane can actually help in terms of uh, blood clot stability. Even if with CGF, that was not required or non mandatory. So, what is the biological rationale then? We said that in a way, in a way, the use of actually blood growth factors can be a viable alternative in, in periodontal regeneration. Because we said, actually, we can actually match the uh, wound healing and the wound stability. We can actually give a space provision, especially if we are using these blood growth factors as a booster together with bone grafts, and we might actually even have a sort of uh, respect of the bacteria contamination because they work as an antimicrobial agent. Then we know that this can match all the other factors that we said. But then I am still, still persuaded that the surgical technique is really important. It, this is not to basically because I want now for you to become skeptical on the use of growth factors, but just because it's the combination of both that actually helps a lot. So even using CGF in our college with our students, we want actually to be very strict with the use of the surgical techniques. And the surgical techniques are all surgical techniques in which a papilla preservation is obtained. You know, we can actually decide if we want to run a mist, so elevate even the papilla from the palatal side, 
because we need to assess maybe even palatal defects and we want basically to create more space but now it's not more required it's not required anymore regarding the space provision for big bone graft for big use of non resolvable membranes i would suggest if possible to go for modified mist or sfa that means flaps in which you will basically open just backally keeping the papilla in place for all the vascular vascular concerns we discussed about so it means just to avoid a sort of vascular impairment that will stay for 10 days just to keep all the vessels in place as we said before the papilla is the network of all this vascularization and then always try to coronally advance actually advancing coronally as you do normally for recession coverage as you might know this kind of technique gives you the opportunity first of all to make the blanket longer so whatever you need to cover that coverage will happen anyway second to avoid to create tension in the wound healing and to create tension at the uh, flap meeting uh, okay at the flap outline third because the coronary advancement of a flap brings the blood clot to become more stable and you can get some regeneration there is a proof of evidence that even when you do a normal mucogingival surgery to create to cover roots for recession you might have in the deepest part of your flap a sort of regeneration even if you didn't use anything actually and then try to manage the flap properly with microsurgical techniques. At the same time, the same defect concept that will apply in any case. So blood growth factors are not a miracle thing that will be able to grow a periodontal ligament and alveolar bone when you have a, 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 a horizontal defect. You need to have the same concept behind this so a vertical defects potentially a frication involvement that shouldn't be uh, frication grade three you need to have the favorable condition you need to have a very good adhesion to the root surface because the growth factor will help you for that but you need to keep everything running in the same way you need to have a, eventually a tenting effect improved by the layering of membranes in this case the use of growth factors and the use of CGF will basically benefit of a double layering of membranes. So basically keeping one membrane on top of the other one, this will improve the meshing and will improve the layering, especially if the meshing will happen upside down. So in a way, you will have the mesh uh, crossing together, making the mesh network that we discussed about in CGF is very well announced to become even greater. Then you can actually combine before the graph to the, uh, to the growth factor to create sticky bone. That will basically make this uh, graft to become more manageable in terms of grafting technique. And then after layering with membrane, you can use liquid CGF to bioactivate the healing because there is a proof of evidence that CGF or growth factors in general are very active in promoting healing phase. So this is a case uh, I am presenting. You can see there was a big defect around the molar, a vertical one, a sort of grade one approaching grade two. With the student, we tried basically to avoid uh, the no, um, to avoid basically uh, a resective surgery that would actually. Uh, create problems on the other teeth. A conservative surgery was not, in this case, very, very well indicated because it was not actually uh, able to obtain a good results and closure of the pocket, as we know now we are willing to do. We included a vertical release, but now I am trying to avoid those just not to make any vascular impairment. And after the flap elevation was done, everything was debrided. A combination of uh, CGF and, and BIOS was done, and layering of membranes was done. And the adaptation, that is from one of my students, very clever. There is a slight mistake in the adaptation of the flap, but it, you can see how coronary was actually placed 
in order to achieve regeneration. You can see the difference in terms of recession, quite the same as before, but in terms of results, um, you can see how different was the result. You can see from here to here how big was the effect and how big was the bone on the, on the, on the X-ray. This is another impressive case. This tooth was having a very big vertical defect, seven and seven, four on the palatal side, recession on top of the tooth, another, uh, the, the surrounding tooth with a crown, a big exposure and recession, a vertical defect was, uh, was checked with uh, bone sounding. You see, again, um, uh, a simplified papilla preservation technique was done. And in this case, uh, two vertical release to improve the coronary advancement was created. So bone graft with the um, autogenous blood growth factors, in this case, CGF again, and uh, basically placement back. This is basically uh, at the healing, you can see uh, the recession slightly improved or at least remained the same according to the vertical defect we've got. And this is the amazing, wonderful radiological effect we got. Uh, another case, as you can see here, another uh, case of uh, several defects around a premolar and molar. Uh, again, um, a papilla preservation technique done with a simplified. The papilla in this case was raised just to give more chance to the student to approach the defect, to degranulate the defect. Again, in this case, a combination of, uh, I would say, a sticky bone, bone graft, together with autogenous growth factors, and the flap placed back coronally. And uh, as you can see here, from five, six, uh, and four, we went back to one, two, one. So we matched actually the gain, the cal gain we have in, uh, in, uh, in regeneration, have a look at the recession that improved uh, in terms of recession reduction. And, and, the, uh, and on the palatal side, from four and eventually nine to two and two. Honestly speaking, this can be done by everyone. And that was a, a grade two uh, fecation defect together with an infrabony defect that was completely cleared. So I guess this is working now. The surgical technique was effective, fine, because we know that the surgical and microsurgical techniques with the papilla preservation are able to work, but is the only that, I think that the blood growth factors are actually giving us a good results as well. And they might be responsible for the early healing, first of all, for the nice healing, I would say, and even for the, um, uh, regeneration in a proper sense for the boosting. Having said that, of course, as, a, as an academic, I want basically to flag if someone of you will join research and academia later on, basically that we might need future research on growth factors uh, in a lab clinical connection because we know some biological aspects we know some clinical aspects, but we need to make a very good, you know, liaison between the clinical side and the laboratory side. But then we need even evidence-based research because as soon as these papers are not actually high quality and they are not randomized controlled clinical trial, the, run, the hierarchy of the evidence cannot be brought to a, a very good level, but we will still keep those in the gray literature. And the other thing that actually I am very interested to, and I am trying now to push my students to look at, is the tissue specific use. Because in a way, from our studies, we found that PRP might be very helpful in triggering the soft tissue healing, while CGF and PRF might be more aimed to the healing of the heart tissues. So this is what we, we want. Um, recapping how growth factors can help the biological response in periodontal regeneration, we said as soon as we want to have a blood clot stability in regeneration, they can do that. Um, absorption to the roots, fibrin mesh triggering, we want that, they can do that. 
provide graph stabilization and sticking effect, they can do that. Actually, this will help the, blood, the wound stability to happen. They can do that. They are even antimicrobial, more than potentially endocrine or others. They can do that. In the future, if we can actually trigger or select the tissue uh, to be basically boosted to, to heal, that will be a good option. They can boost the stem cell differentiation, either the, the periostal cells, the periodontal ligament cells, and this is something that they can do and they can actually help in regeneration to happen. And then what's more? Just to end up my presentation, I want to show you my um, group of students, of full-time students that, that together with the part-time students are joining Dental Dent and the MSc in Periodontology at the College of Medicine and Dentistry. I am so lucky to have a so nice and enthusiastic group of people that in the future will become leader in their countries, in Asia, in Europe. And I'm really, really lucky as a, an academic and as a clinician. Now, if I am ready for your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Flavio, for the very interesting topic and valuable information. I personally really benefited from it, and uh, it indeed enlightened our view on growth factors and regeneration. It's really amazing and impressive how there's a lot of factors with each its function that can work in coherence for a better regeneration. So thank you once again for taking the time to share your precious knowledge with us and making its understanding goes very smooth. Now, since the topic is very interesting, we have received tons of questions, and I hope we can take a little bit of your time to answer them. Yeah, of course, with pleasure. Um, the first question says, can growth factors be used to help accelerate the recovery in bone or gum graft? Sorry, um, can we, uh, is, the, is, the pre, is the first question you mean, Amza? Yes, yes. Okay, can we... No, 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 I can read them on the side. So can we expect the same amount of regeneration in endotreated teeth? Actually, um, in terms of uh, growth factors, honestly, I am not able to give you an answer. But in terms of regeneration, there is a proof of evidence that um, we don't uh, have differences, but it's normally uh, better to avoid to endotreat teeth, especially with very deep defects, if they don't need it. Normally, when we have potentially um, a very deep defects, our concern is that when we will open the, the, the flap and we will go to root surface, create our, to do our root surface debridement, we might end up having the tooth that will lose its vitality. Cortellini and Tonetti in 2007 said that this is not happening, or at least there is a very small percentage as, uh, about this outcome. So in a way, we can expect the same uh, regeneration because that is actually starting from our periodontal ligament cells that after endodontic treatment will still be there. Hopefully I answered this question. Let's go on. Uh, um, there are some questions that have been asked on Instagram and on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, I kind of grouped them and I would like, uh, like to ask you here before uh, reading the side comments. Is that possible? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I'm really, really happy. Okay, so the second question is, is regenerated tissue hard as healthy tissue and what are the differences between them? Okay, this is a very interesting question. Actually, in terms of histology, they prove that it's the same tissue. Uh, it, it, it basically heals and matures in time. Um, in terms of clinical feeling in your hands with your probe, it looks like a slightly softer than the usual tissue. But then there is a proof of evidence from histologic studies that they are quite the same. However, I would like to send you a provocation because I, 
I like this kind of uh, way and I suggest you as young dentists and dental students sometimes to think outside of the box because don't take everything as a rule. Be always critical because there is a, um, this is the starting point of your basically learning process, learning curve. There is an evidence from Skulian who was able to prove that potentially regeneration doesn't happen as a process because he was able to show in his slides that between the, grow, the, the, the bone graft, for instance, and the root surface, a slight, very simple layer of epithelial cells were there. So going back to a long junctional epithelium. But then, uh, but then we are safe enough that basically regeneration happens and all the tissue will be there at the same time. But in terms of feeling, it's a slightly, slightly uh, weaker. Honey, I cannot hear you. You mute your phone, your microphone. <laughs> now it's on you. I was muting it uh, to avoid any disturbances. And no, I forgot no. to remember. Absolutely. So um, moving on, uh, does the granulation tissue that is used in healing process is exactly the same process as in those healthy tissue and other parts of the body? Uh, sorry, uh, it was a little bit disturbed the line. Can you repeat that for me, please, Anya? Sure. Does the granulation tissue that is used in healing process is exactly the same as in those healthy tissue and other parts of the body? Yeah, granulation tissue is quite the same, but then it's the, basically the, the recruitment of cells that might be different, and especially the healing time frame that might be different. Yes. Okay. Um, which, which growth factor has the most effective response in periodontal regeneration, or it is that many factors have to combine together to get the best response? Okay, as we said before, Hania, we actually... Have the proof. We don't have a clear proof of evidence because, unfortunately, uh, as I said, we uh, the studies are not at the, the high level of hierarchy, and so they are not um, the usual study we are used to in the best evidence dentistry. Um, in terms of uh, uh, actions or boxes, as I said before, it might be PRF and CGF. Definitely PRP is not basically as effective as they are because it, it ticks less number of boxes. So PRF and CGF are really effective, but then we need to have the proof of evidence coming through later. In terms of combination, there are either proof of evidence that we don't need to combine them with anything else, and there is a proof of evidence that we need to combine them. So still the knowledge is uh, uh, debating. So we can't say this is better than the other. Maybe someone of you can do a very nice paper later on. So demonstrating which is the best combination and which is the best option either to use it alone or to use it with something. Honestly speaking, from my clinical point of view, if it makes sense, I would always follow the same uh, instructions or rules of regeneration. So we will combine materials according to the size of the defect. So if you need to create the walls of the, of the box in which you have the blood clot to remain stable, I will put many, many things to increase the stability. So for instance, if I have a very deep and contentive defect, I will use only a booster. Can it be endogen or a growth factor? If the defect is a slightly bigger or has a, a, a wider angle, I will definitely go for a biogos or a bone graft together with a booster. If the defect is even wider and the number of walls decreases, either I will not regenerate at all or I will use the, the bone graft, the booster, and the membrane. That is the rationale. Okay. Um, 
will the clot will the clotting happen immediately immediately during the surgery? Basically, a few hours later. Do you remember the histological slides I showed you during my presentation? In few hours later, basically the blood clot is already there and it's very stably uh, um, st in a in a stable way adhering to the root surfaces. Yes. Okay. Uh, any contrast? So this is the reason why you need always to check very well all the information from the medical history because as you might know few medication can actually interfere with blood clotting so th these kind of procedures are really are really affected by this the use of these medications by the way sorry Anya. no worries um any contraindication for using biological stimulators it is recommended to use it every time for every regeneration case for a battery healing as I said, um, we found out that MDOGAIN, for instance, if we want to now to go outside of the presentation, is very effective and it can be used alone or in combination with other things for regeneration. It actually boosts the periodontal ligament cells with these amelogenins to come over. So there is no contraindication for that. Even in terms of people having medical conditions in which they are using some particular medication, it seems like that it doesn't affect anything because it's a local thing. In the use of autogenous growth factors, blood growth factors, even in this case, there is no contraindication at all. In, uh, they can actually give you benefits rather than side effects. The only side effect is that the patient needs to have his blood withdrawn before the surgery. So you need to have a sort of uh, confidence in uh, blood taking on patients. But that is the only concern that might be there. That's it. Okay. Uh, there's a question that says, what does coronal advancement mean? Sorry? What does coronal advancement mean? Ah, yes, okay, okay, that's right. So coronary advanced flap is basically a procedure that we perform in root coverage, right? So basically it is a sort of uh, uh, surgical flap that is intended basically to be slided coronally in order to provide a soft tissue coverage around recession or basically exposed re roots. Um, the question, I mean, the, the concern about coronary advanced flap is not only basically to design the coronary advanced flap, but just because you make this flap basically to be extensible without any tension. Because now the concept in surgery is that sutures, in a way, are used just basically to end the job. It's not something that actually gives you the opportunity to make the flap wound to uh, meet together so the flap itself should be able to be to meet together because whatever is actually you know stretched too much doesn't work doesn't heal so in in a way in this kind of flap to make this to happen you make a sort of dissection of periosteum from the supra um, connective tissue and you remove all the muscular insertion. Doing this, you will make your flap to be able to slide in a passive way towards the coronal side. This is a kind of procedure that is used in mucogingival surgeries when you have aesthetical, I would say, aesthetical concerns rather than regeneration. But regeneration in this case has taken information or concepts from muco to be more performative. Okay. Um, is there any specific medicine to prevent the bacterial infection? Well, super infection. Well, I can say that might be antimicrobial, systemic antimicrobials that normally we actually prescribe in surgery to patients. Uh, that is a debate because, um, you know, antimicrobial prescription is uh, something that is still very debating in different countries. So the, the, the guidelines, even if we are all aiming to prevent bacterial resistance, there are still some countries like mine, Italy, in which people are prescribing a lot of antimicrobials. Back in the UK, 
you need to provide the evidence why you are prescribing those. If there is not any particular medical condition, and trust me, for prophylaxis, and trust me, there are so few now at the moment, or you don't have any particular concern of uh, post-operative infection, potentially you might rely on the antimicrobial properties of the um, of the growth factors without prescribing any antimicrobial later. Otherwise, that might be just the use of, uh, of anti antibiotics. Okay, so I think that's it with the questions. Uh, would you like to add anything else, Dr. Flavio? Well, I would like to add basically uh, one, uh, one simple reflection. Uh, I was not fond of this technique a few years ago. I was very, very strict observing the regulations and the guidelines provided by all the regenerative world, that is basically the world of Cortellini and Tonetti, and the use of uh, biomaterials. When I started using these blood growth factors, I had to change my mind. But this is not a, a sort of... Uh, an, I would say um, uh, an invitation for you to consider them in a funny way. Everything needs to be used according to the to the best use of it. So don't be too much enthusiastic. Be always critical, and try basically to use the right things at the right place and the right time. I would suggest as a, as a father for all of you basically to start improving your surgical skills as soon as you will be able to have best in the best control you can in the basically your surgical skills that in terms of regeneration unfortunately are very very high end then you can start using them because in a way they are actually very cheap <laughs> because they are the blood patient the patient's blood and then you can actually not to harm the patient because it's not something that comes from something else. They are not coming from animals. And you can actually combine them if you want to get the best benefit you can. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Flavio, for your words. Thank I'm you sure for after you. Uh, your, your many years of experience, many of us like look up to you so yeah, thank you for that you have, exactly if you have later further questions i'm really really happy to receive emails and basically liaise with you all my email address is flavio.pisani at gmail.com this is my personal email you are absolutely free to to write me uh, and i will try to answer the best i can okay thank you so much we really appreciate it and we hope uh, you have all enjoyed this lecture we are looking forward to have you with us for the rest of the webinar lectures. And uh, here we have come to the end of our first webinar with the amazing Dr. Flavio, which we would Thank like so to much. thanks once again from IDS family. And hopefully this will be the first of many lectures with you. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to wish you uh, uh, a nice day. And uh, we'll you. keep in touch, of course. Yeah, a good luck to everyone, and uh, hopefully we will meet in person very, very soon. Okay. Thank you so much. I hope so. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye, bye, Dr.